우리 마을에는 먹을 것도 없. 이 초등학교에서 우린 선교사들은 모두 생략이 되는 In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was past the harm. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this, for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korean. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word. God, nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here? She cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. And then I shared the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen.
one day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Chiang Mai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We were frightened. Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, Many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. Brothers and sisters in North Korea live under the threat of being considered an enemy of the state for having faith in Christ. Yet, they hope their sacrifice will be worthwhile, just like Pastor Hans. Hope is what Pastor Hans shared, hope in God. But God was a treasonous word. And it was dangerous to share the Bible. It is dangerous to, to own a Bible and to share one with other people in North Korea. Yet, yet, it all began with an act of kindness, an act of kindness helping a man gather mushrooms to sell. And for two years, Pastor Han worked with Sang Chul, placing himself in danger before he told him the reason why he was doing this. It's because I am a Christian. Pastor Han, as we heard, was killed being labeled a terrorist. And there's violence in our world against Christians, all, not just in North Korea, but all over. And the skeptical would use questions like Habakkuk's when he asked, in verse in, in, in Habakkuk one, why would you make me look why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Skeptics would look at this as evidence that God is not just. Or worse, he doesn't exist. And if like Habakkuk, we only consider what we see, we might make the same conclusion that that Habakkuk made. In verse 4, he said, destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. But is Habakkuk right? Are those who draw such a conclusion right? If you answer yes, then you must think that God is not just or he doesn't exist. But if you answer no, they're not right, then you must have a reason for such confidence. And do our brothers and sisters in North Korea suffering persecution have reason to be confident with such hope? And what assurance do they have that God is going to take care of them beyond the persecution that they're suffering? Is there evidence that God's judgment is right? Which is, you know, is to ask, is God just? Well, Paul writes in, to the Thessalonians as, and, and as, as they're suffering in verse 5 of chapter 1, 
He says all of this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Well, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that God's judgment is right? Well, the evidence that God's judgment is right is seen in, in their response to the suffering. What's the response? Well, we see it in verse 3. The response is that of growing faith and, and increasing love for each other. Look at verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. So in the, when the coldness of, of persecution was pressing and, and, and surrounding the Thessalonians, they turned up, the heat of their love was turned up, the heat of their, their faith growing, they turned it up. And the ramping up of their love and faith gave Paul something to boast about to other churches. In verse 4, he says, therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. This lets us know that persecution and trials need not prevent you from growing in faith and love. In the video, Pastor Han, he's an illustration of this truth. That even though, did you think he knew that he was putting himself in danger as he went to help Song Chul? That he was placing himself in danger, but yet he helped him gather mushrooms, and to Song Chul's surprise, he didn't cheat him. And he let him keep his liver. Uh, and this impressed, this impressed the mushroom picker so much so that he had to ask him after two years of, of this, why do you help me? He says, it's that act of love. It's that act of love and faith that was evidence that God's judgment is right. Persecution and trials need not prevent you from growing in faith and love. But why is God's judgment right? Well, verse six tells us it's because God is just. Since, as the verse says, he pays back trouble to those who trouble you and gives relief to you who are troubled. Now, that sounds simple, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that, a, that sounds like a simple understanding of, of, of justice, of God's justice. And, and in many ways, it's, it's kind of like what you learned as a child, what you recognize right off the bat as a child, that the wrong you suffered at the hands of the, of the person who caused you to suffer, that person should suffer it. You hit me. You should be hit. You learn, I mean, it's not, that's the way you, you think as a child. Yeah. But you say, say, wait a minute, though. Aren't we supposed to turn the other cheek? Aren't we supposed to pray for those who persecute us? Aren't we supposed to be peacemakers so that we might be called the children of God? Yes, that is true. That's, that's what God called. That's, that's what we're called to be as citizens of the kingdom. That's who we're called to be. We're not called to take the place of God. God is just you and I, not so much. But why does God ask us to suffer the wrong? Well, it's because our response to the suffering is evidence that God's judgment is right. And the result is, verse 4, the latter half of verse 4 says, as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. This helps us to know that the persecution involves you, it involves you, but it's not exclusive to you. It happens to you, but it's not essentially about you, but it's about the kingdom of God. And in it, God counts you as worthy. So what's the basis of your suffering? Do you suffer for the kingdom? Or do you suffer for wrongdoing? Or are you suffering for selfish reasons and, and trying to get ahead? The scripture tells us that God pays back trouble to those who trouble his people and he gives relief to those who are troubled. That's good news this morning. To everyone who, who suffers on, on behalf of Christ, who suffers in the kingdom, it's good news that God pays back trouble to those who trouble his people. Hallelujah. I mean, his trouble doesn't last always. 
But how do you know that he pays back trouble to those who trouble you? What assurance do you have? It's there in the gospel. Christ's suffering, his death and resurrection, the gospel is the assurance that we have that God pays back trouble to those who trouble you. Because remember, Christ was unjustly put to death. He was charged with treason too. So John 19, 12 tells us when the Pharisee said to Pilate, anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And then further, a terrorist is traded for Christ. In John 18, 40, when the Pharisees and all those who were there exclaimed, no, when Pilate wanted to make the offer of, of to give them Christ, no, not him, they said, give us Barabbas. And the rest of the verse tells us how Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. You see, the Lord of glory suffered death for all who have sinned. But he himself did no wrong. He had no sin. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. His resurrection and ascension show how God has brought relief to the trouble. And now, as verse 8 of, first of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us, Whoever does not obey the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction. That all the trouble that was thrown onto Christ, if you reject Christ, it comes back on you. So not obeying the gospel is the biggest act of wrongdoing against God. He will repay. So the gospel is the ultimate evidence that God's judgment is right. See, those who trust Christ don't get what they deserve because Christ took it on himself. Their suffering for the kingdom is evidence that God's judgment is right. And the gospel answers Habakkuk's questions and breaks his illusion that justice never prevails. God is just. Hallelujah. And the Lord Jesus is coming again. See, the point of this evidence is this, that God, through Jesus, preserves his people in their suffering. And since he has preserved us, we can persevere, increasing in our love for each other and growing in faith. Now, how do you respond to such news? How do you respond? This is, that this is, this is the gospel, and it applies, and it applies to every area of our, of our lives. How do you respond to such love and hope? Now, we can take a note from our, from our brothers and sisters in North Korea. Back in 20, I ran across this back in 2016. North Koreans were, were praying for Westerners. The Voice of the Martyrs in Seoul, Korea, reported this in, back in 2016. Uh, one, one defector's response, remarks, he said, you pray for us, we pray for you. You have so much. You put your faith in your money and your freedom. In North Korea, we have neither money nor freedom, but we have Christ, and we found he's sufficient. So how can you and I respond to, to the evidence that God's judgment is right? What demonstration of faith and love for our brothers and sisters can we persevere in? Well, one, and it's huge, we saw it at the, end of the, at the end of the video, and we see it here in the scripture, pray. We can pray, and we're going to do that in a minute. But also, Dave Brown, and louder than words, has another practical way for us to stand with our persecuted friends. And Dave, and Alex is gonna give a testimony, and then we're going to pray, Kyungku Kim will, is going to come and pray for North Korea and then we'll all pray together silently. So my, my shirt says, I'm a criminal. Maybe not in America, but in many, many countries around the world because of this. It, it has scripture printed on the back. It has a cross on it and I could be thrown in prison or persecuted at least in many, many countries. Sue and I are the directors 
of the Louder Than Words Discipleship Ministry and the voice of the martyrs is very near and dear to our hearts. Over the past 11 years, we've made a trip out there with a team of young people to serve at their operations center uh, at the headquarters in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So, and that, that being the case, I've asked uh, a Louder Than Words alumni if he would give a short testimony about his experience there at the Voice of the Martyrs. Alex? So, yes, my name is Alex, and I've been to Voice of the Martyrs several times, and what we're doing in those two photos is we're helping them distribute their magazines. Now, Voice of the Martyrs' purpose is to serve the persecuted church and connect us with them. So these newsletters have stories of the persecuted Christians and prayer requests that we can offer for them. So if you don't receive if you, their newsletters, you can go to persecution.com, and I highly encourage you to go there and receive their newsletters if you haven't. And incidentally, that persecution.com is printed in your bulletin today in the little blurb on the side there in the bulletin. So Kenny and Jonathan know our connection with the Voice of the Martyrs, so they asked Sue and I to organize a request of our congregation. Uh, this request is to make a tangible application of today's sermon to impact our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. So you might ask, well, how can Grace Church here in Dover, Delaware make a tangible practical impact? And the answer is action packs. The intent of action packs is really twofold. First, action packs meet some very practical, physical needs. By the way, this is an action pack. We ordered one from the headquarters. It's a clear plastic bag that we fill with some very practical items. And Sue has some practical items to show you. Socks. There's a, a light sweater or light jacket or sweater. Blankets. Um, towels. And where's the squishy ball? <laughs> we even put a squishy ball in. It's a very uh, specific list of items that they pack in these action packs. So, secondly, and maybe more importantly, the purpose of action packs is to remind our persecuted and oftentimes isolated brothers and sisters that God has not forgotten them and that we are all united through Christ's love. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, Kenny just referred to this, therefore among God's churches we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. So many, many of our brothers and sisters are enduring persecutions and trials that are completely, we're oblivious to here in America by and large. So the original plan was for Grace Church to collect these physical items and then ship them out to the Voice of the Martyrs headquarters. But we ran into a pretty significant problem with that idea. And as I looked into the uh, shipping, the freight, to ship from Dover, Delaware out to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, was gonna cost just shy of $1,000 to send just the action packs. So both Kenny and Jonathan agreed that this option would not be practicing good stewardship of the Grace Church's resources that we have. So plan two, this is the new plan. Um, now we're gonna ask the congregation, you all, to make a financial donation at $30 per action pack, which is the approximate cost of what it would take to fill one. The donations you can see when on the, on the overhead, they're due by November 17. And that's, that's three Sundays, including today and next Sunday, and then the Sunday after that. So you have three opportunities to get your uh, $30 donation in. So how can you make these donations? You can go to the church app, Grace Church app, and make a donation there, I trust. Jeff, yeah, yeah. And you could also do it the old-fashioned way and write a check to Grace Church, 
And then on the memo line, just put action pack. Uh, last week, there was a flyer in everybody's mailbox that had these details listed for your help, for your assistance. So now here's the, the, the catch of this, of this new plan. This is where Louder Than Words is going to be partnering with Grace Church. We are planning to serve again at Voice of the Martyrs in Bartlesville in the spring. And the idea is that we will bring the donated funds, and when we get to Oklahoma, our team will go out in the evenings and purchase the items in Oklahoma. And then we can hand deliver them to the operations center the next day, avoiding the $1,000 freight charge. So that's, that's our, whole, our hope. And we've also set a goal. We would like to raise enough funds to pack en enough action packs to fill 50. So 50 is the goal. And there's one other really cool part, I think, is that when the deacons heard about this, this idea of supporting the persecuted church, they have agreed and committed to match the first 25 action pack donations. So that's double your money. Um, so remember, our goal is 50, and it's due by November 17th. And by the way, we will be sending a couple of text messages and emails in the next couple of weeks as a friendly reminder to share what we have with our persecuted brothers and sisters. Thank you. <laughs>